Yes. Right. So hi, everyone. Uh, I am Michael Leclerc. I'm working uh, with the Arnaud Group uh, in um, bioinformatics. Uh, this is the last session. I hope still have some energy for the last 40 minutes. Uh, I'm going to present you uh, a number of you of the current uh, and future advances in, uh, of AI in proteomics. Um, so by the end of the lecture, I'm going to explain you a bit of machine learning, uh, how AI is used in proteomics in general, and uh, maybe the current and the future advances uh, in proteomics or the application of uh, AI in the proteomics. So as maybe not all of you I may be familiar with the concept of AI, machine learning, and deep learning, I'm, just, uh, I'm going to take a few minutes of what is machine learning and how it works. Uh, just a general conception of artificial intelligence when you hear about it. It's uh, when they're talking about the field of computer science that enables the machine to imitate human intelligence. Uh, of course, if you check movies, it's something else, but at least for the news, it's generally that. Um, and within that, you have the machine learning. All the machine learning, it's the branch of AI where all people well, all mathematicians and uh, computer, computer science guys developed uh, algorithms to provide the machine the ability of automatically learn. And within the machine learning, you have the specific area of neural networks, and this is the deep learning. So all the subfield of machine learning based on neural networks uh, is usually the, the deep learning uh, procedures. And um, how to define machine learning, usually, it's when you allow a system to learn by itself and improve automatically uh, from experience. When I say experience, it's, it's historical data. And uh, the most important is you don't need to explicitly program what the model will do. That's the data which detects how the mathematical function will be modified to uh, fit your data. Um, and your goal is to build models that are able to make the predictions because you want to predict something, an outcome, a disease, or whatever. Uh, and when you do that process, you are able also to identify what's the informative data because you have so many inputs and probably noisy information you don't need. It. And by making this model, you are able to, to, to understand what makes the difference and what is important to, to have the, the prediction, the predictive performance. Um, and the power of machine learning is to, re to um, make relations within your data, to make a, de a decision, to make a prediction. And uh, this is why you can also discover the relation within your data. And at the end, when you have your model, you can end with the, the generative AI. You can generate new data based on your model. So this is the general conception of uh, the objectives of AI. So how do you build the model? The, the building a model is about training. So this is a learning process. So the goal is to adjust the mathematical model, mathematical model uh, the classifiers also called, uh, which is represented in a specific data structure. Um, and you are uh, adjusting that by predicting a set of categorical or numerical values, depending on uh, uh, what you have or what you want to predict. And uh, more you have data, more you gather the data and feed the data within the model, uh, then it's updating and it's optimized to get a better performance uh, by uh, pro providing uh, accurate predictions. And there are many ways to, to, to learn. Uh, also the, the most important one, the, the most used one is uh, the supervised learning. So you know what you want to predict. Uh, if your patient has a disease or has a specific uh, cancer grade or is healthy, this is your outcome you want to predict. And um, so you are training the model by trying to fit this specific outcome. Uh, you have unsupervised learning. So this is when you have a set of data of patient or whatever, and uh, you don't know the label. You don't know what's happening to them. Uh, but it's essentially you want to try pattern, to find patterns or structure uh, within the data without explicit guidance. So it's essentially clustering. All the clustering data, all the clustering uh, algorithms that have been developed is unsuper are the, in this unsupervised uh, uh, field. And um, so of course, there are many other ways to, to, to learn. You have sometimes semi-supervised learning. So you have a set of, of label data and you have uh, unknown uh, label data. So there are ways to, to learn from both of them. Uh, 
and there is also the reinforcement learning. So it's but it's usually used in um, in video games or robotics. Uh, there are some cases in, in biology where you feed a system regularly and you can do reinforcement, but it, it's uh, it's less common. So how is your input? What do you feed in the model? Um, you can imagine a simple that table format. So you imagine your first column could be your patient uh, label, um, and then you have a long list of information. Uh, it can be your protein, uh, the type quantification, of course, uh, but you can add everything you want, uh, gene expression, uh, polymorphisms, uh, and even clinical pathological data or any metadata you have. So the, the beauty of the system is you have many uh, machine learning classifiers that are able to take numerical and categorical values, which is uh, very easy to, uh, to, to implement. And um, you can have your last column, which is your class label. Uh, that can be your outcome, so disease versus normal, uh, and even uh, product concentration because it accepts also numerical values in your class. And you have to follow, uh, because machine learning is, uh, is data hungry for sure, uh, but there is a, a, an expression, garbage in, garbage out, so you really need to be focused on how you generate your data and how do you feed the system. Uh, if you have nice data and just noisy information, and it will be hard to get something uh, relevant at the end. Um, and you have many steps to follow uh, that are not easy. Um, once you have your data, you need to pro probably normalize it. Uh, you sometimes have missing values. You have to uh, explore the um, feature selections or feature extraction uh, problematics. Uh, sometimes you have so much data that it's really hard to, to put that directly in the model. So there are ways to optimize that and to reduce the dimensionality of your data. Um, and there is also the choice of algorithm. There are many of them. Uh, each algorithm can be parameteri parameterized uh, differently. Uh, so there is also an optimization on it. And, uh, and when you finish to build your model and you need to revi you refine it, then you have the, the cross-validation. So every time you take a part of your sampling, of your, uh, of your samples, and you keep aside a, a part of it to test the model at the end. And you can do that many, many times to be sure that you have something robust and uh, having the accuracy which follows every time you, you make a different sampling. Uh, and at the end, when you have something robust, then you take new data, you come back to the lab and you try your, and you submit that to the model and you, and you check if it's still accurate. <laughs> And when I talk about machine learning algorithms, there are really many of them. So you can spend a lot of time to try them all. Uh, well, all of them won't work. So that, that's why tools are, have, been, uh, have been created for that. Um, but if you're a mathematician, you will probably uh, know some of the, of, the, of the term here. You have Bayesian's, uh, Bayesian's models. Uh, you have the regularization models, or the regression function. There are many ways to classify your data. Um, you have the simple ones, uh, just linear regressions or quadratic regressions, which could maybe not fit well uh, complex data. Of course, you can go to something more complex, such as neural networks, um, or human readable ones. Uh, if you have decision trees to build your model, it's very easy for a human to read it, to follow the decision, to understand how the decision is made by the model. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very, it, it can be very accurate too, but it really depends of, uh, of what you have uh, in your input data. And uh, uh, talking about neural networks, that leads us to, to the deep learning. So I think, the, um, of course, there are many, many ways to do deep learning and it's very complicated. But the major difference is you don't need uh, what we call the feature extractions. You can imagine a set of data, such as mushroom layers. Uh, you, need to, to, you need to describe your data. You can't just feed it like, uh, like this in a, in, a, in a machine learning model. So you have to extract the shape, the colors, uh, if they have white dots or not, whatever you want. And then you go to a classification procedure and you hope that you have extracted enough information to make your model. In deep learning, it's different. You go to with your image and you go directly in the neural network. And the neural network job is to extract 
informations within your image. And uh, it's automatically tries to dissociate information within it. Um, you can imagine a, a picture where the, 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 the different layers of, in, of, uh, of the neural network will decompose the image and trying to find specific edges, specific forms, and gather them together, compress them, decompress, recompress, etc. There are many ways to, to extract the information from complex data. Uh, and, and some models are really huge because you want to predict anything you want in an image. So of course you have a dozen or million of classes uh, to, to, so, so you can have a very big model. And it's widely used in, uh, in, in biology. Uh, you can imagine uh, just uh, the slide of pathological data uh, where the goal is to segment and understand what's uh, in, the, in, the, in the slide. But they are really data hungry. And the neural net network architectures design can be infinite, extremely complex. So that's that's why it's a complete another field from from machine learning. And um, the application are numerous. Um, in uh, in cardiology, uh, you you can extract many information, a lot of information, which is perfect for deep learning. So it's still it's, it's that hungry. So I, I can't imagine uh, feeding a transoptimal data data at uh, five hundred dollars per sample. But when you have images, uh, it's easier to to feed uh, this kind of model. Um, but if you have a lot of omics data, of course, it, it can be also trained on. And the application uh, are unlimited. For sure, you you can uh, you can imagine a, a, a biological field. And you check on the Google Scholar, and you will find a deep learning model or a machine learning model that have been trained on on the on the data. Um, it requires, of course, specific materials. You all know uh, about uh, GPUs and the need uh, of this uh, of this instrumentation, um, and some expertise with the deep learning uh, libraries. But specifically for uh, proteomic research. So, what do we do uh, in terms of, uh, of AI applied to proteomic? Since uh, 2006, uh, precisely, uh, the first model arised uh, to solve complex problems in proteomics. Uh, you now are aware of all the steps from the sample prep to get the protein functifications. There are many of them. And uh, in, the, in the last years, uh, so many people tried to create specific uh, AI models to help or to improve uh, specific steps uh, on uh, in in the proteomic uh, acquisition and in mass spectrometry. So at the beginning, in the years two, uh, two, 2006 to 2015, most were machine learning uh, to predict uh, peptide return to time, uh, predict spectra directly from peptide sequence um, or fragmentation patterns, and uh, the last one tried to to, to perform peptide identif uh, identification. They are they're limited, um, not, accurate, not completely accurate, but th that was the first step. And, and that the deep learning uh, arised. And um, now we have uh, many tools for, for, for all these steps uh, to, to identify, quantify peptides uh, in, in DI, for example, for DINA, if you, if you, uh, if you are aware of it. Um, and everything in the goal to, to go to the, to the step biomarker discovery. Uh, so, of course, we can uh, improve every steps of this uh, of this uh, of this long uh, list of, of steps. Um, but anything you can do at the end, uh, you go to the protein configuration and you try to to solve a, a realistic problem. And um, for biomarker bio protein biomarker discovery, uh, we have um, from your clinical cohorts. You get all so the mass spec uh, data on your proteomics. Uh, you can go directly to differential expression, as most of people do. But it's an univariate approach. What you want to do with machine learning or, or deep learning, but this is going to be an example of machine learning, uh, is to go through your data and try to find the relations, uh, the, the story of. If an exp uh, you have a specific protein which is highly expressed, another one don't express, et cetera, and you can have a story of, of, of uh, into a biomarker signature. And um, in, in the lab, we have developed uh, a tool for that, uh, which is called BioDiscamo, uh, which essentially automates all the machine learning pro um, steps and uh, to build predictive models and, and, uh, and signatures. 
And it's completely automated uh, for the sampling, the feature ranking, feature selections, uh, uh, to the training and evaluation. And from this, uh, it's going to train many models and try to, to make a stepwise feature selection to end with a very, very short uh, list of, uh, of biomarkers or of peptides. Uh, and then we also implemented some tools to visualize the signature. And after that, after creation, optimization, and, uh, and, uh, and consensus signature, you can arrive uh, with the clean signature and go directly to, to check if it works for the diagnosis or therapeutic uh, response. So this is an example of, uh, of tools we are also developing in the lab. Uh, I'll continue with the other, other examples. Um, we also have uh, reporting quantification at the end. Uh, but you probably uh, heard about the patch effect problems. Uh, so you have you have a small variabilities in your protein quantification across uh, multiple experimental batch, and even if there are ident you have identical samples, same conditions, but you go to an instrument and, and uh, you come back a month after and you observe a shift in your data, and it's not a linear shift. Um, in the lab, we are, we had the uh, many kind of data which have uh, this problem, and uh, the existing batch effect correction method didn't work uh, or always not always working very well. So we developed a tool uh, which is called Bern, um, which involves the idea of perform the classification of what what we want to predict directly in the encoded version within the deep learning architecture. And um, so th this is a, it's not a pure transformation uh, where would you, you have your data, you, know, you, you have your transform data at the end. We do the classification within the architecture. And uh, we observe that depending on the data, not the same architecture will, will fit very uh, the, the same. So the tool, the tool just in, involves many architectures within it and to transform the data. Uh, and uh, so we published that uh, recently. Of course, the problem with the, with the deep learning, it takes all your features at the end. You don't have to do the selection. So you need to go through the architecture during, after the training to understand what has been informative to get your signature at the end. So that's why we also implemented some tools called the uh, Chap Explainer, which tries to retrieve the path of the decisions between the the, the deep learning architecture to understand what are the best features and what was informative at the end. Um, so, and uh, we also have a uh, copy ML that have been uh, developed with, uh, by Eloise here. Uh, so here it was uh, a tool developed for automatic peak picking for label-free uh, targeted proteomics. So here we had uh, also to use machine learning because um, some peaks sometimes are uncertain and may need human intervention to be selected and uh, to be uh, identified. So we tried to develop uh, there is a, a fully automatic approach. And uh, what she did is uh, to, to try to train the machine learning models to, to predict all the, the, the peptide peaks in spectra for, for, for uh, specifically uh, for uh, selected uh, reaction monitoring. And um, in the lab, we generated uh, many uh, samples from urine samples and uh, get the SLN data. And uh, what Eloise did is the feature engineering. So you remember, I told you that in deep learning, you don't need to create your features, but in machine learning, you need to. So we get a peak and we try to extrapolate what kind of information we can get from this peak. Uh, the density of the peak, the, the level of the peak, uh, the level of the transitions, all these features are computed and created uh, to be fitted in the model. And um, she created a, a lot of data uh, to make a training step and uh, an evaluation step. And uh, she tried many, uh, many, many uh, machine learning models. And at the end, we ended with uh, a pretty good accuracy to, to improve the reproducibility of the peak clicking process. And uh, to that really, really, really reduce the time necessary for analysis. Um, so these are the tools, and we also have application. Uh, this is a, an example of application that has been uh, led uh, by Florence uh, in the lab. So the, the goal was to, to skip the bacterial uh, culture when you have a urinary, urinary tract infection uh, sample. And uh, by using LCMSMS, we wanted to, to, to see from the, from the list of observ observable peptides 
from bacteria within samples that have been inoculated within urine, if we were able to able to find a, a specific signature uh, within the, the, the original data. And with machine learning, when we add the peptides, it was great. We, we've ended with a 95% accuracy uh, a signature, uh, but it was a 90-minute run, so it's it's very long. So now we are also deriving the, the from creating another project uh, since a few years now to work on very short analysis, a very short run, uh, three to five minutes. But the problem here, you don't have the peptide identification. So we need to go to deep learning to analyze the raw data, uh, and it's a completely another job. Um, we have an accuracy that is less than the, the, the one with peptide identification, but uh, it's still reasonable and we are continuing to, to work on it. So these are for the current advances. And uh, now the question is, uh, what's the next step? And uh, since a few years now, you just heard everything about generative AI. And this has been generated uh, by We With Done Away. Uh, <laughs> So in biology, you will see that since two years, you have, uh, you're starting to have papers, starting to use the generative AI applications to generate new molecules, uh, drug-like molecules. Uh, you also have to, the tools to, to now to create new protein sequence, uh, synthetic uh, gene uh, sequence too, uh, the synthetic data also, so you don't need to generate it in the lab. You just learn from a lot of data and you try to generate new synthetic data. Uh, filling missing data is also a, a big topic. Um, they also try to create synthetic patient data to make virtual clinical trials. Um, and, and you have many other applications that are arising right now. Um, so this is for biology in general. And, uh, and for proteomic, uh, there is also application now. Um, so you have generating models that are trained specifically on protein sequence, structures, and uh, the goal is to generate new proteins uh, with specific structure and functions. Um, and these models are, are gathered, are submerged with discriminative models. Uh, these models are really focused on predicting specific properties uh, of your protein. And when you merge them together, then you can have a model-guided protein design uh, which involves the generative model. And it will propose you new, new protein with specific st sequence, structure, uh, and specific properties. It's uh, really useful for drug development, uh, imaging markers, uh, disease diagnosis. And you have a lot of companies that are uh, uh, you know, rising from that. Um, first, I'm going to show you uh, Alpha Proteo. You probably don't know uh, DeepMind, uh, the people who worked on AlphaFold uh, in Google. Um, AlphaFold can compute a lot of uh, protein interactions, but they can't create new proteins. So very recently, maybe two, two weeks ago, I think, um, you have alpha proteo that have been trained on proteomic data bank data and hundreds of millions of alpha predicted structure. And now it generates candidate uh, proteins that bind to specific location of a target molecule. So you have a structure of a target molecules and a set of specific binding location you want to bind in the, on this molecule. And alpha proteo will generate a candidate protein directly. Uh, but the website is online. I, I haven't tried it, but uh, you can. Um, and uh, and I, as I wanted to say that uh, now you have a lot of initiatives uh, that are surfing on this wave to, to creating a novel design functional enzyme or develop synthetic proteins, uh, peptides with novel chemical, chemical uh, properties. And uh, many people believe uh, on this, uh, of this, these technologies. And in parallel, so these are the tools to generate information, but in parallel, you also have the protein language models. And uh, the goal of these models is to interact with the model that have been specifically trained on protein data. So, you know, the, it's based on large language model. The goal is to predict the next world, uh, probably already uh, out of it. And um, what you have in, uh, in the natural language is uh, already a context. So you can talk about, talk about politics, sports, whatever you need. And the model will fit to this uh, area of expertise to generate English sentences. You can imagine the same thing for proteomics. Uh, you want to create an uh, immunoglobulin and you ask the protein language model to generate a sequence from it. That's going to be the same process. 
And the next level of, uh, of these languages is to take also in account local properties, such as uh, I want a phosphorylation site, an active, a specific active site, uh, or more global properties about the organism, or eventually information about stability, uh, location in the cell. In the cell. And, and all this level of information and abstraction are getting better with the time. So the first version were about just generating uh, amino acid sequences. And now we go to the, the multi-domain 3D structure. Uh, and there, there, are, there are commercial agents that are still to rise, starting to rise. Um, of, of course, we can start to, to ask ChatGPT anything uh, or Gemini, uh, anything about proteomics data or specific protein. There, there, there is already general knowledge in these models. But if you, if you give him a structure, he, he won't know anything about it. He won't reply anything. And this is where the open source uh, is great. So from from uh, from model uh, that have been um, delivered by the private companies. So for example, the Liam Free from uh, from Meta. Uh, thanks to them, you had we have now biological experts models uh, and proteomic experts model that have been uh, developed uh, based on uh, this foundation model. Uh, so I'm going to show you just an example of uh, two more two two recent uh, tools that there is Prot uh, Chat GPT. Here, it's, it's focusing on understanding protein structure to natural language interaction. And your only input is a PDB file, so a protein data bank file. So you give it to him, and you ask, inform you ask any information about it. Uh, you can describe it. Can it give you uh, what is the dynamic of this protein? Uh, are there drugs uh, that can target this protein, et cetera? So, and depending on what it has been trained, uh, it will answer the, the, the knowledge from, uh, from this. And uh, there is an extension of it, um, protein GPT, which is multimodal now. So we can provide a structure and a protein sequence and another information. And uh, it, you can uh, essentially start a conversation to get more information about it and to, to, to eventually have a specific mutation, what will we do, etc. And the, the evolution is really rapid for sure. So. You know everything about the proprietary model. You can have a ChatGPT six uh, that's going to five. I mean, and then six. Uh, we don't know at what level the kid would be answer, able to answer these questions. But the open source is also working a lot. And uh, so you have the, the example I just show you. Uh, the protein GPT. Uh, it's uh, it's two months ago, and many other models will rise. Each of them will be better and better, more expert. Maybe more expert than you, of course. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, so the goal is not to be replaced, of course, but to make you better, to make you more, more efficient. So my last message will be co-create with AI, and uh, you will see you can have a, you'll be able to to create magic. And uh, thank you for the team of my of our new